Howdy folks, I'm Mark. I make stuff, and today we're going to be talking about this thing I made, a text adventure game engine built in React. We'll go over the project structure and the code, as well as the development of the content. In the last few weeks, I made two games with this engine. You can have it all at the Caperville Mall, and greetings from Squalor Holler. More on those later. All right, are you ready? I know I am. Let's dig into this. As a huge nerd coming of age in the late 70s, the personal computer revolution hit me hard. We lived in a world with just four TV channels, if you were lucky, and no internet. Phones were enormous and connected to wires. When my dad brought home our TRS-80, a sleek gray and black number with a CRT monitor and a delightfully chunky keyboard, I could feel the world rotating around us, like the meet cute scene in a romantic comedy. I still remember those late nights learning basic, the 60 hertz hum of the monitor and the smell of warm plastics, most likely outgassing something that will surely shorten my life expectancy. All of it comes back to me as if it just happened, as if it's still happening, every day when some dumb new project idea pops into my manic brain. Some folks pine for the simplicity and raw excitement of their first experience with a PS1 or an NES. For me, the most beautiful game I've ever played had no graphics at all. I am, of course, talking about text adventure games. I played loads of them growing up, but the one I still think about fairly often is Pirate Adventure by Alexis and Scott, not the Dilbert guy, Adams. Very early on in that game, you need to climb out onto a ledge of a very high building and say a magic phrase. If you go out there without non-skid sneakers in your inventory, you may fall to your death. In case the player was wondering, is this game messing around? The game was there to remind you repeatedly that no, it was not. Coming as it did after Colossal Cave and its many imitators, Pirate Adventure played with your expectations. The navigation from area to area was not entirely dependent on the exits list. Often you needed to go shack or go stairs to get where you needed to go and to advance the plot. They pushed the boundaries of where you could go with simple two-word verb-noun statements, including a method for catching synonyms and a clever way of triggering conditional actions and randomized events. And they did all of this with a TRS-80, sometimes affectionately referred to as a Trash-80 due to its lack of color display and embarrassingly tiny 16K of RAM. For comparison, the contents of an email chain of moderate length would be too much for this thing to handle. A smallish JPEG file would be simply too enormous, if the thing could display such files at all, which it absolutely could not. The fact that the Adamses got all of this to run on a machine with 16K of memory and a cassette drive is simply incredible. Not only that, the game engine code was in highly readable BASIC rather than assembly. As a kid in the Elkhart Public Library, I found an issue of Byte Magazine with the source code. Most of its highly efficient syntax was new to my eyes, but I could tell that this was not the morass of nested if statements that I expected to see. The game data and the interpreter were entirely separate. They had created a game engine, one of the first of its kind, that could be used repeatedly, allowing the team to quickly develop a dozen or so games if they wished. And that's precisely what they did. If you were an underhanded little kid, like I was, you might take a sneaky peek at the game data to find out where to go next when you get stuck. Surprisingly, this did not work. Due to the nature of the engine, scouring the data did no good at all. It was just a forest of integers followed by lines of disconnected strings. Fast forward several decades, and in 2004, I made a simple PHP and JavaScript interpreter for the original games with the permission of the developer. It was fine, but I took it down in 2010 when I shuttered the old Flash content. Now that nearly two further decades have passed, I created a new version of the engine in React, diving deeper into the original engine's twists and turns than I ever had before. The intent here is to combine the old with the new, a modern interpreter that runs on the browser and saves your game using local storage while preserving many of the same innovative methodologies of the original. A side note for folks who are genuinely interested in text adventures, aka interactive fiction. This genre is still very much a thing, and people are making interesting stuff for it right now. Most folks these days use Inform, a very nifty language for interactive fiction. You should definitely check out what this community is doing, and look into making something for yourself. It's very fun, and I know that from personal experience. I made a game with Inform V6 back in 2004, called Eric the Power Mad Dungeon Master. A sort of attempt at a game within a game text adventure? It's fine. We live, we learn. Anyway, end of side note. 
Since I can't include the original Adams games in the Git repo for obvious copyright reasons, it didn't make sense to tether myself to the original feature set. So I made several improvements. Most notably, we're using good old JSON rather than the wild and woolly DAT files used in the original. Like a fool, of course, I made this decision. After sinking several days into making an interpreter for the DAT files, it was fun, but there's no way I'm going to write new content using that method. Also, we're not limited to 16K here, so the game content can expand to fit the underlying concept. One weird convention that I kept from the original is the first-person storytelling. As players, we're not experiencing the game directly. We're telling our in-game avatar what to do, the avatar will report back what it sees and its impressions along with the occasional, I have tripped in the dark and now I am dead. I like this approach when playing the games, but it's very difficult to remember to always use first person. I end up mistakenly writing messages and descriptions in the second person. For example, you have fallen into a pit, rather than I have fallen into a pit. Somehow it's funnier to me if the player is causing the person inside the computer to do something that the person inside the computer knows is ill-advised. At certain points, I have the avatar say snarky things like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, but it'll get me killed, I refuse. Of course, behind the scenes, we say this because we need to gate that action for the sake of the game. It just seems more fun than just saying, the game isn't equipped to let you do that yet. At the core of the original engine is the idea of a verb-noun command structure. Go north, take cat, spin plate, etc. Verbs and nouns exist in arrays in the game file, so each word gets a numerical value based on its index. The numbers are combined to create a vocab value. During the player turn function, the game will check the array of vocab objects for a match of that number. If there is a match, the system checks a variety of conditions in the object. Are we in the right room? Are we carrying the right thing? Is a bit flag set or is it unset? We also use conditions to pass parameters to the actions portion of the turn. These are just numbers that, based on the action, take on different roles such as room numbers, item numbers, or bit flag indexes. The original engine had slots for five conditions. Some of the turn transactions in my games were complex enough to require up to seven, so I expanded the conditions arrays a bit. If the conditions are met, the action is carried out. We allow for up to four actions. These are often text messages that appear on screen, commands to drop an item or swap its position with another item, etc. In addition to the vocab array, the game data object has a list of events. Events have conditions and actions just like vocab, but they trigger automatically at certain points in the game. In one game, we check a bit flag as you enter a specific room, and if the flag is set, we trigger an event. We can set the event to trigger at any percentage of randomness that we want. In the previous case, we used 100%, because as soon as the player enters that room, we want that event to occur. In another game, we used a car radio and a mall's PA system to deliver content, jokes, and clues. And we used a fairly low random threshold here to make sure that the messages felt sporadic. Surprisingly, saving and loading games turned out to be about the easiest feature to implement. The game's turn-based system keeps track of everything ephemeral in the game state object. This includes item locations and bit flags. When you save your game using a command like save game one, we simply save the JSON blob of the game data object to a local storage record with a name based on the game's file name and the number indicated. That way, you have an unlimited number of save slots, and you can load a game by number easily with a command like load game one, load game two. One of the most frustrating things about text adventures for most people, including myself, is that you often have the right idea, but you aren't expressing it in the exact verb-noun combination that the game wants. The original Adams engine had a nice technique for mitigating this. The list of verbs and nouns allowed for asterisks at the start of certain words to indicate that they are synonyms for an earlier word. For example, if you have a disco ball item in your game, the list of nouns could include BAL and asterisk DIS. If you try a command like take disco ball, the interpreter would pick up on disco as the noun and then, seeing the asterisk, would then fall back to ball. You'll notice that the code only really cares about the first three letters. This simplifies things enormously and adds some forgiveness for bad spellers, guilty as charged. It does, however, create some potential conflicts if you have two words of the same type, noun or verb, that share the first three letters. Of course, the vocab objects check a variety of conditions. So in several cases in the games that I made, I end up reusing words with different conditions. 
Call it inelegant if you want, but it works. Adding on to the synonyms of the original engine, I turned the vocab matches into an array so that we can have phrases as synonyms. This is enormously helpful when creating game content. When you have two ways of saying something, you only need to create one vocab object to handle it. For example, you might decide that the user would try a command like turn crank or use crank or use winch, since in context, they all mean the same thing. We could find the numerical values for those phrases and add them to the array in the vocab object. It's easy to manage and makes games less frustrating for players. Making games for the engine was enormously fun. At first, I'd only planned on doing one game for it, but the process was so enjoyable that I was bristling with ideas by the time the first one was halfway finished. The second one also took a fraction of the time of the first because I knew the tricks of the trade by that point. Make a map first and list out all the words and items that I wanted to include. The first game, You Can Have It All at the Caperville Mall, is set in 1978, the year the original game engine was created. We explore the local mall and try to discover why so many local residents have been disappearing recently. Risk life and limb to get coffee and donuts, bring two lovebirds together, create a splash in the art world, and chase down a cat. You know, adventure game stuff. The second game, Greetings from Squalor Holler, is an idea I have been trying to get off the ground for over a decade. The idea of taking characters from Greek mythology and placing them in sketchy everyday situations intrigued me, but after several failed attempts to make it work in other game formats, I had all but given up. While working on the first game, I found some old sketches of the town from a previous attempt, and it dawned on me that this might be the best way to bring this idea to life at last. By default, content development tools are available to anyone who plays the game. Once you load up a game, click on the plus icon below the text input, and you'll have access to a very odd looking control panel. You can use this to create content for your very own game if you want. Go to the Git repo and clone it locally, then create a new game JSON file and add a reference to it in the index.js. Once you load it up, access the dev panel and start creating your game. You'll probably want to copy the example file and add some rooms and items, as well as some words for the nouns and verbs arrays. Once you have the basics in place, you can use the dev tools to create vocab and event conditions and actions that you'll need to create the actual game. I have spent decades chasing that feeling I had when I first loaded the cassette for Pirate Adventure. Along the way, I think I've realized that writing code is kind of a text adventure in and of itself. Is that an incredibly cheesy thing for me to say? Oh, yes, it absolutely is. But I'm sticking with it because I'm incredibly grateful to folks like Scott Adams, again, not the Dilbert guy, for inspiring little nerds like me back in the day. If you want to play the games, check out adventure.ridiculopathy.com. There's a link in the description because who wants to spell that? Also, the link to the Git repo is in the description as well. Go ahead and clone it so you can make your own games, or look up the original Pirate Adventure Basic code, also link in the description, so you can make your own version of the engine. I mean, go nuts, have fun, make stuff. Bye.